Today we're looking at the music theory from Sonic 3's Desert Palace music, and if someone were to ask you quick right now for $100, is the song for Desert Palace in a major key or a minor key? Think fast, what's your answer? Alright, fine, I'll even let you listen to a couple measures and then you can decide. Alright, time's up, what's your guess? If you said major, I don't blame you because the melody establishes a fairly happy sounding arc, but it's actually minor. Not only is the key of this section minor, but all three chords it uses are built on minor triads, D minor, E minor, and A minor. And yet it can still manage to sound this cheerful and fun. But just listen to what these chords sound like on their own. Yes, it feels like a funeral march. Desert Palace is able to subvert that association because the lead melody utilizes this motif. And even though, sure, all of these notes do conform to the tones of A minor, it's structured to emphasize the key pillars of A minor's relative major, C major. There's lots of notes on the staff here, but the most important ones for you to know about are C majors 1, 5, and 3, which stand as the main pillars of C major. The way they appear in sequence, you could think of them as a C major triad in first inversion. It's these notes that matter most, while the others make supporting contributions, more of a means to travel from one pillar to the next. It's impressive how well this melody throws the listener off the scent that there's a devious minor foundation underneath the whole thing. Sure, we think of hot areas as exotic getaways, but hidden underneath the novel allure are uh, threats of dehydration, quicksand, cacti that hurt when you touch them, starvation, getting picked over by desert buzzards. The song Section B gets a bit more cheery, accomplished in part by utilizing A minor's relative major, which is C major. This is not so much a key change, but rather using the same building blocks of A minor to highlight a more lighthearted tonal center and the chord progression employs a standard 1, flat 7, 6, 5 progression. Which, on its own, is nothing revolutionary. However, it's the way section B geniusly leads into section C that really impresses me. See, section 3's chord progression is a 4, 3, 2, 1 walk down, the same one that 8-bit music theory talked about in the Sonic video, in which he illustrated how it's utilized on multiple occasions in Sonic 1's soundtrack. It's in Green Hill, Labyrinth, and Spring Yard Zone. As an example, let's look at how Spring Yard uses it. And here we see it again in Desert Palace, a nod to the series' compositional roots. But the real Eric Wareheim mind-blower occurs when you consider the second section as adjacent to the third. A 4-3-2-1 walkdown is awesome in itself, but here, in total, we have an 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 one walkdown. The song walks down the entire scale. That's an octave's worth of chordal descent. I can't say I've ever come across this before. This is insanity. On paper, it's so simple that it seems like something a five-year-old would compose to just walk down the chords in a linear fashion like that, totally casting aside the strong chordal motion generated in a more circle of fifth style progression. Look, mommy, I did it. It's like how Picasso said, it took four years to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child. And this brings us to the most excellent ending melody. It's like climbing up steps signaled by the blue notes, but each time you reach a new stair, one of your feet taps the stair below it, signified by the orange notes, and then continues on its way. If you did this in real life on a staircase, that would constitute moderately worthwhile exercise. Now, notice how the very first beat of the measure is a rest. There's no note there. If you had instead started this exact sequence of notes right on that one beat, it would look like this, and it would sound like this.
Notice that now what you get in this measure is four equally sized groups of notes, almost like clusters of grapes. You could imagine that some rigid old school composers would think this is appropriate, but instead it's as if the composer said, hey, army of notes. Everybody move to the right by an eighth note. And then the army of notes was like, well, okay. And then once they all move, the group of notes is like, Hey, wait, no, the one beat is the important, dominant opening moment of the measure. We ought to be utilizing that key moment by putting a note there. But the composer says, ah, but you see, sometimes you can speak volumes with simple silence, my young grasshoppers. So in the interest of scientific precision, I shall now employ the now method that Ola Lilia uses to point out exact moments of songs that he particularly loves. So where does the spike occur then? Well, when they say now, that's when. Now, it's that staccato note that I just so love. Alright, so now here's Desert Palace's subtle but effective moment of silence, a melodic rest, in the end sequence. Now. There's another Sonic 3 song using a similar instance of silence on an important one beat, and that will be covered in a separate video. The last thing to talk about is this note right here, which you might have noticed is an accidental, by which I mean the key of this song uses all white keys, but this note steps outside that framework. In the Lava Reef video, we talked about how that song is bold to use an accidental right out of the gate, but in Desert Palace, we see a more conventional use of an accidental. There's only one accidental in the entire song, and it comes literally in the last measure, the second to last note in the entire composition, at the 11th hour. It's like the final stretch of a competition match where you're stretching your neck forward for a photo finish, and anything goes. And what function does this accidental serve? Well, remember that the song began in A minor, and then sections B and C had quite a bit of fun in the relative major, C major, but now we gotta bring it all back home to where we started. So if the ultimate destination when we loop back to the start is A, well then using this accidental note, G sharp, makes a lot of sense because it is directly adjacent to the destination of A. There are no notes in between the two, so G sharp is all up in its biz. It's like when you hear that G sharp, your ear is subconsciously thinking, oh baby, I'm gonna be hearing an A soon and it's gonna be great. To fully comprehend its effect, you need to hear what it would have sounded like if it had stuck to only chord tones with no accidentals. It would change not only the melody, but the chord underneath it too, meaning this E major would become an E minor by lowering the third like this. Oh yeah. And then the whole sequence would be this. Prepare yourself to dry heave. <laughs> oh god, is that awful! It's drab, and it would threaten to undermine all the work that the song's A section did to hide the minor key elements under a cheery facade. But instead, what we get is... It's just a delight. <laughs>